if you look at every popular mainstream object oriented language with one exception and you took the object orientation out of that, they're all gonna be better languages, I claim. <laughs> and most people are like, no, you need you need this, you need that, you need that. I'm like, I don't buy it. I, th I think the history has shown that basically all of the good parts of OO languages turn out to not require objects. Welcome back to the Backend Banter Podcast, where we talk about backend engineering and careers. Today, I'm joined by Richard Feldman. Now, Richard is the author of the Rock Programming Language, which you may have not heard of yet. Don't feel too bad. Um, but I was actually pleasantly surprised. I was on Richard's podcast just, I mean, we recorded just like a week ago. Uh, and I didn't even realize that... Richard was the author of the Rock Programming Language, but I've seen it on Hacker News a couple of times. So it's actually like it is at least gaining some amount of steam, and I'd, I'd love to see it, you know, gain some more steam. So, um, Richard, can you take just a second and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so, hello, I'm Richard. Uh, I, I created the Rock Programming Language. I, I used to be the sole author of it, but now there's a bunch of people working on it, so I, I can't claim to be the only author. Um, I am the author of the book Elm in Action from Manning Publications. So Elm is the language that inspired Rock. It's, it's more of a front end language, which I know this is a back end podcast, but <laughs> okay, Rock, Rock, much more on the back end side of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to talk about Rock. We'll talk a little bit about Elm. Um, we'll talk about functional programming, which seems to be a more and more recurring theme on the podcast, uh, which I love because frankly, I feel like OOP, you know, did a lot. Um, on the back end side, specifically with like Java and C Sharp, Python, oh, Ruby, yeah. and these days we're seeing, yeah, a lot of damage was uh, <laughs> a lot of damage was dealt to the industry, and now we're seeing. I, I wouldn't even say like com like purely functional stuff on the back end, though there is some of that. But even just like a move away from OOP um, into languages that have more of a functional style, um, even if they're not purely functional languages, uh, things like go rust and then of course ocaml being uh, much more uh much more functional okay i want to start broad and then we'll narrow in the first question cool. i have for you is you'd mentioned um to me when we were recording on your podcast you'd said functional programming makes simple problems harder and it also makes hard problems simpler and i thought that was like the best take on functional programming that i've ever heard <laughs> could you could you elaborate on that yeah, sure. So, um, so I guess I have a story that's re relevant to this, um, a back end story. So at my previous job, um, a company called No Red Ink, and we made software for English teachers and like millions of teachers, millions of students answering billions of questions. So not like, you know, picobytes of data, but like a lot of data. And we were running into this problem where we were coming up on the limit of like the highest single database instance we could get from Amazon. So we kind of referred to this as the database apocalypse because if we didn't solve the problem somehow before we hit that, um, we were just that was, that's it. No more, no more questions. That's no it. No more Game vertical over. scaling. Yeah. Right. Um, so we had to do something. We looked at sort of uh, sharding, like breaking it into horizontal scaling. For various reasons, we concluded that was the wrong way to solve this particular problem. Um, what we needed to do was just to get some load off of the database, especially in a couple of critical spots. And the problem was that so we were using Ruby on the back end, Ruby on Rails. And we had uh, a lot of code in this sort of section that was using Active Record, which is Ruby's ORM, like Object Relational Mapper. And I don't know if you're familiar with Active Record, but it's very side effecty. Like you'll do mm -hmm. one thing, and you'll be like, just change this part of this user, and it's like, okay, I'll go update the database, but also I'm going to do all these other things and update these other relations that relate to it in memory. And so you mean so like problem... you do a like a user dot save or something? I, I'm making it up because I haven't done a yeah. ton with Ruby syntax, especially in a while. But like user dot save, and like instead of maybe just saving the user record, it's like touching other tables. Is that kind of essentially? Yeah. I mean, so so it it has some things in common with like database triggers, where it's like when, whenever you do a certain thing, there's a bunch of stuff it'll do for you, sort of for convenience. Okay. And the problem being in this case that what we wanted to do was we wanted to cache this one big operation. So caching is a really nice thing for like pure functions, pure functions being ones where 
you call them with the same arguments, you always get the same answer and they never do any side effects. They don't affect any other observable state about the program. Um, that's great if you want to cache something and, and caching is the solution to your problem because all we have to do is say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, whenever we get this particular set of data, we'll just substitute it with the answer that we got from somewhere outside the database, like Redis, right. really, really fast cache. Now, the problem was that because all of this code was super side effecty, you couldn't just cache it. You couldn't say, oh, I, I see this thing. I'll just substitute, just skip all that, all, all that stuff and go straight to the end because all of these side effects were load bearing. They would, they would cause bugs elsewhere if, if we skipped them. And so what we ended up having to do was it was like an 18 month of an entire team's project to make all the changes necessary to basically convert it from this very side effecty thing into a pure function in a basically in a functional style and then make the changes that were necessary to introduce caching and some cues also as well. But, um, but the main thing was just that we had to get it into that more functional style. So this is an example where if we'd written it in a functional style to begin with, this would not have been an 18 month project. This would have been a much, much simpler undertaking, but because we hadn't, it was a really, really big expensive project. Um, and that's an example of like making hard problems. Like that's a hard problem. Caching is a famously hard problem a lot easier because if you're already writing it in this pure function, heavy style, well, it's, it's naturally amenable to that. Um, on the flip side, I, the, the example that we talked about on uh, software unscripted, which is my podcast, um, was uh, loops. Like you learn how to do a for loop and a while loop, and you can solve a whole bunch of problems with that. Um, in pure functional programming languages like Rock, you don't have for loops, you don't have while loops. There's other techniques that you use instead of those to achieve the same thing, but there's more of a learning curve there for sure. And so that's an example of it's like, it's not like this is rocket science, but it's definitely harder. And yeah. so that's an example of like an easy thing getting a little bit harder, but the benefit, which you maybe don't see until you're sort of further along and like solving much harder problems or confronted with much harder problems is that those problems tend to get easier in my experience. A absolutely. So that, that's, that's definitely been my experience. And I've never even really worked in a purely functional language in production. I've done a lot of toy stuff. I've played around sure. with a lot of like pure script, Haskell, OCaml. Oh, wow. But okay. I have not like deployed to production uh, right. in those languages, and but I do teach functional programming on Boot Dev, the basics, like an intro to functional programming course, and it it is the fourth course in our curriculum. So we we start with like okay, learn the basics of programming, which we do in Python. Then we teach um, object oriented programming, and there's like a little course mm -hmm. on setting up a local development environment, and then we teach functional programming. And functional cool. programming is like this spike in difficulty uh, <laughs> for new developers. It's like, I just learned how to do loops, right? Loops are right. great. I can do anything <laughs> with loops. I love loops. Uh, and now you're telling me I need to use recursion. <laughs> and I wouldn't use recursion, but I mean, ultimately, if you want a full substitute for loops, yes, that is kind of the end, the end game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there's definitely other stuff, right? Like you can do, uh, you know, uh, map, filter, reduce kind of stuff. But right. Um, it is, it is fundamentally much harder to get to like that, that step where you're competent in it, but I completely totally. agree. There's, and I, and I would argue it's really that there's like specific concepts from functional programming that give you like 80% of the value, um, things like immutability and pure functions totally. and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you have some like favorite parts that like when you go outside of a purely functional language, like. What, what, what are the things that you still do, even when you're not working in a purely functional language? I mean, the things that I, the, the main thing that I still do is if I have the option, I will try to make a function pure. Like if, I, if, if that's like a straightforward thing to do with how I'm solving the problem, then that's what I'm going to default to. Um, one of the big differences between functional languages and the functional style is that in functional languages, you don't have to think about following rules as much because they're just, that's just the way things are. It's like you're like a fish is inside water, doesn't know that it's in water. It's just like, hey, how do you deal with all that water? It's like, what, this is just it's how things are. And that's just the, the environment you work in. Similarly, if I'm in rock, I'm not thinking about how do I make this function pure? It's just like, I don't know, that's just kind of the default. And like the only reason it would not be pure or, or like the only way that it wouldn't feel like a pure function anymore is if I need to do some IO, but at least in rock and also in Elm and Haskell, um, that changes the type of the function because now you're returning like a task or, you know, some languages call it IO or future or promise or things like that, rather than just returning a string or whatever it was. Um, so it doesn't feel like it's a big 
mental burden to to follow the rules rather it's more like you know well, at least when i was getting into it it felt more like i'm trying to reach for this thing but that doesn't exist so then i have to stop and think well how do i solve this problem in a different way so it feels more like a constraint than a burden if that makes sense like the burden being i have to be thinking actively about how do i not accidentally violate the rules that's not a thing because the, they're just you know the primitives are what you have access to there is no like mutation primitive that you have to avoid um but yeah, it, it is still, at least when I was first getting into it now, it feels very natural to me. I actually, funny story. So the rock compiler is written in Rust. And um, one of the first early contributors was somebody who was super experienced with functional programming, but hadn't actually written any imperative programming in a long time. Rust is a very imperative language. Um, and so he, we were pair programming on, on some early project. And he was like, hey, um, I'm kind of not sure how I should write this part. I'm trying to like do it in this way, but it's like not really working out. I was like, I would just use a for loop for that. And he's like, right, for loops. Yeah, those are things. <laughs> <laughs> like, I forgot, you know, like it's been so long. So it's, there's definitely an element of like, once you do get up to speed, it's like that, that style feels natural. And you, you know, you, you're just like used to that tool set. Um, but definitely, I think the imperative, like, especially when it comes to like little stuff, compared to little stuff like loops, as opposed to like, how do you solve this billion, you know, questions problem? Um, that stuff I think is easier to pick up than the like the functional primitives just because there's more of them. I wish there was some like world class programming competition where like experts from every programming language had to like ship the same project <laughs> in a certain amount of time. And like if year after year we kept seeing like certain languages come ahead, it would be like a decent heuristic because everyone claims that once you come up to speed in their programming language, like I say this about Go, right? Pythonistas say sure. it about Python. It's like, once you learn it, like you can ship really fast. But like everyone says yeah. that. I'd love to see some kind of like competition where the best programmers in every language around the world are just shipping the same app uh, and you get to see really, and like it would have to be kind of complex because it, you could consider some like, especially like web frameworks cheating and they just like give you the boiler, right. boilerplate. So that'd be like <laughs> something yeah. with like some complexity to it. Uh, oh man, that, 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 that would be, yeah. that would be amazing. But you touched on something that I think is a really underrated point, which is that some different languages and also different frameworks are good at different stages of a project. So Rails is like famously really, really good at getting you up and running on a web project. That was like the original pitch. The original pitch video was build a blog engine Ruby on Rails in 15 minutes. And it didn't really have much to say about what happens when you're not in, you know, minute 15, but you're in month 15. Like now, how much does it help you? And it turns out not as much as a lot of other technologies help you. Um, but because it's so good at getting up and running, a lot of people successfully got their businesses off the ground right. using the fact that it's so good at getting you off the ground uh, and up and running. And then like, I'm thinking about um, like Shopify is like a famous early example of this where they, you know, th there was an interview where the, the, the creator of it talked about how Rails really helped him get up and running fast. And it was like a, just a perfect fit for what he did. But now, as I understand it, they've written their own Ruby VM to try to work around some of the performance problems they ran into, which I'm guessing if they'd gotten it up and running in Go, they would not be doing that because right. Go just runs a lot faster. Um, there's these famous stories about like they had, there was some company, I think it was iron.io that wrote a blog post about how they had 30 Ruby web servers. And after they switched to Go, they went down to two web servers. And actually it was that one web server would have been way more than enough, but they wanted to have a backup. So they had two, right. like the same traffic, <laughs> right? I like just didn't even need one full web server and they just had one for redundancy. So yeah, it's, it's like you, you do run into different sets of problems as your, uh, <laughs> as your company grows, your organization, your code base, whatever. Yeah. I, I had a similar story. Like one of my first jobs writing Go, we were moving some backend like web services from Ruby to Go. And it was like crazy that we were even using Ruby and specifically Ruby on Rails for these services because there was like no HTML rendering involved. It was just like data oh, APIs. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the only reason they were used was because the rest of the app did use Ruby on Rails. And so okay. there was a bunch of Rails developers. This so was like, well, we sure. can just do it quickly in Rails, right? Um, but yeah, the, the difference... Like it was like two orders of magnitude in terms of like compute speed um, yeah. for the kinds of computations we were doing. Uh, so yeah, we had like this, you know, a similar uh, switch of like 30 services in Ruby to like one in Go. And it doesn't always map that way. I don't want people that are listening to this sure. to just think Go is always 30 times faster than Ruby. It's very problem specific, <laughs> but like sometimes it is. Yeah. 
And well, and and although it is problem specific, it's like more common than than not. It's not like, oh, that's that's a cherry picked example. It's like, no, that's 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 kind of on the typical side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's also worth pointing out. I think you mentioned something really great, which is that like different technologies um, are strong at different stages in like a company's life cycle or in a product life cycle. And you'll often, and you have to keep this in mind. Like when you're on Twitter or YouTube and you're hearing opinions or you're listening to this podcast and you're hearing our opinions, right? I think it's really important to remember like these people, like where do they work, right? Like where are their opinions shaped from? Like if you're listening to somebody who's like, I don't know, building a kind of custom e-commerce site using like some JavaScript framework and like it's a solo operation, they might be really into like Next.js and Vercel and like all this kind of stuff. Um, whereas if you're talking to like an infrastructure person that works on like S3 at Amazon, like they're going to be interested in way different technologies, right? They're solving right. very different problems. And so it can be a trap, I think, for new developers. They just hear like X is good, Y is bad. But like you really want to just be, I would say, context aware. Yeah. I, I definitely, um, I had a past job where uh, we, we had a backend that was doing um, compute on like a, a large amount of like scientific data. And uh, it was like petabytes of, of data going through the system. And I remember a couple of the people on that project talking about how a lot of people will say that they've got big data, quote unquote. But what they mean is like this whole data set could fit easily in memory on my laptop. And they're like, right. That's just, no, you, don't have, you know, you, you can, if you want, you can turn that into a massive, you know, distributed system, but you don't have to. So maybe you shouldn't. And like, maybe, maybe you're just kind of making things harder for yourself because you imagine that you're going to have this scale someday. Um, whereas they're like, yeah, we have to deal with that right now. And like, it's not possible for our data set to fit on any one machine in the world, unless, you know, it's like some bespoke custom supercomputer, which, you know, would be a <laughs> way out of our budget. Right. Different problem. <laughs> that makes no that that makes perfect sense. I was just talking to um I know it was my professor on our distributed systems uh episode oh, yeah, yeah. where he was basically yeah. saying the same thing. Like it's not really big data if you can fit it on a thumb drive, right? Yep. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes exactly. it can feel like big data, especially as like a new developer, because like you open it up in I don't know, if like you can open it up in a spreadsheet or in like a SQL client, you see that there's like a million rows. But like a yeah. million rows actually isn't that much data when you look it's at not, it yeah. at like the byte level. Um, yeah. So. Although it does matter like how much overhead is associated with each of those. So yeah, a yeah. million rows of data in C versus in Ruby is actually a lot more memory in the Ruby case because every single row and every single column and every single row is going to be an object, which means it has all of this extra metadata and stuff associated with it. Whereas in C, it's probably just going to be the bare minimum amount of memory required to represent that. And that's it. Right, right. And of course, like, I guess I'm, I'm ignoring all the nuance of like, you could have giant JSON blobs like in each cell oh, sure. in, the, in, yeah. the, in the rows. But yeah, if you're like storing what most web applications do, which is like timestamps, IDs, and like maybe a string, uh, a million rows isn't too much to, too much to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So I want to tie this now all back into Rock and talk a little bit more about Rock. Um, let's start with like the motivation behind Rock. So like, why does the world ye- need yet another functional programming language? Yeah. So I mean, I I could, well, I could I could take that broader and say like, why does the world need yet another programming language? Right. Yeah. Um, the usual answer to that question is one of several things, and I can say what the answer is in Rock's case. In one case, somebody's just like, I just wanted to make the thing. I just I thought it'd be fun. And this is not one of those projects. It's not like a hobby. You know, oh, I'm just going to do this for fun. This is like. I want this to exist. I want to use this. This is solving a problem that I have. And I think a a lot of other people have. Um, The second type of reason that people make a language is that they need to take some existing language and they need to sort of like enhance it or do something slightly different, like fix some problems. And for whatever reason, they can't upstream that into the actual language. So I would say like Kotlin is an example of this, where it's like they they just want to take Java and make certain things about it better. Um, Mojo, if you've heard of that, is like a new language that's like a superset of Python. TypeScript is an example of this. Um, there's plenty of languages that are in that category. Rock is also not in that category. Um, Rock is in the category of, I have a set of problems that can't be solved by any existing language. The only way to solve those problems is to make a new language. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, 
basically, I guess it really kind of comes down to certain characteristics that I want, both in terms of user experience and also like as a user of the language, and also in terms of performance characteristics. When I say performance, I both mean runtime performance and also compile time performance. And actually Go is one of the inspirations here because Go is one of the few languages that I'm aware of that's like really good at both while also having automatic memory management. So like mm -hmm. Zig is a language that's really fast build times and also it runs really fast, but also you have to manage all your own memory, which uh, right. has is, is a whole can of worms. Um, and like, you know, for a certain set of problems, that's awesome. Uh, but there's also a certain set of problems. Like if I'm doing a startup, I probably don't want that. I probably want to just not have to worry about memory corruption bugs at all. And just like the language takes care of that. Um, so I wanted something that has those characteristics, but also a bunch of other characteristics that, again, there aren't any existing languages that I could get all those things from. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So is Rock a compiled language then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so also similar to Go, like when you build your Rock program, it just spits out a executable, like a binary executable you can just run. Oh, you don't need okay. to have Rock installed on your system to run it. You can just build it and then say, here you go. Here's, here's your executable. Go ahead and run it, you know, whatever operating system you built it for. So how should we think of it in terms of like performance class? And actually, let me let me back up. So sure. in my mind, you've basically got like fully interpreted programming languages like Python and Ruby and JavaScript. And oh, I, yeah. I, I feel like JavaScript has kind of separated itself just because there's been so much engineering work put into like the V8 JavaScript engine Legit, that actually yeah, right. does write, uh, you know, uh, run quite a bit faster than Python and Ruby tends to. Yeah. Um, but then you've got like in another class, you've got like uh, kind of Java, C Sharp, and at least in compute performance, I also kind of put Go into this category, which is sure. like it's kind of compiled. Like Java and yeah. C Sharp don't actually compile down to uh, machine code. They like compile from their virtual machine. Um, yeah. And then like Go actually does, but it comes with a runtime and garbage collector. So it's like a little slower. Um, and then you've got like, the bare bones languages like Rust and C and Zig that are just like hyper optimized right. for speed and memory usage. Wh where should we categorize Rock? So, I, I mean, like literally a thing that we talk about all the time is we're always when we're benchmarking, we're trying to meet or exceed Go. And if we don't make it to the like Rust or you know uh, C or, or or C plus plus tier, we're fine with that. Our, our preference is if we can tie those, then that's that's a win. There's no world in which we can do better than them because, I mean, except on like certain benchmarks where it's like they didn't choose to optimize it. But the whole point of those languages is like, they give you access to literally everything the hardware can do. So it's not like theoretically possible, like whatever program you write, they can always match that by just right. doing it the hard way. <laughs> so, um, so in that sense, it's like, we're not trying to be competitive with that, with like the fastest, because in order to do that, you have to support a lot of memory unsafe operations, which opens up this whole category of really nasty bugs and stuff. So we want to be like, you don't have to worry about those. However, uh, we still want to be super fast, you know, with that in mind. So yeah, like Go, I would also put Swift as like one of the languages that's that's up there in mm, terms of yeah. um, automatic memory management and really fast performance. Um, so like Go and Swift when are, are two of the languages that we're like, yeah, we, we want to really aim for being like at or better, ideally better than um, than those two. And yeah. that also implies like faster than Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, Ruby, all, all those other ones you mentioned. <laughs> right. I found that like Java, C Sharp, and Go tend to be pretty similar in terms of like compute performance. Um, Go yeah. will usually lead by a little yep. bit, but um, not like a crazy margin. Um, but in memory, Go usually does like way better. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just I, we don't need to go into all the details on that. Yeah. But like, I, mean, I, I understand why that is, but yeah, right. We don't need to get into it. <laughs> yeah, I, we've yeah. talked about it on a couple other episodes, but like, uh, where does does Rock have a split like that as well in terms of compute and memory? Um, so we should also do quite well on memory. Uh, so actually, like, um, without getting into like a really detailed analysis of this, like, I mean, we, on, on software and scripted, like, we we get into like the nitty gritty in a lot of <laughs> a lot of cases. But um, I know your audience is like a lot of people who are like new to backend development. So I don't want to like, you know, drink from the fire hose on this, but I'm sure you've talked a little bit about stack versus heap, like yeah. to some extent. Um, so basically rock, we try to stack allocate as much as possible. And we do that by just automatically detecting. So like in Go, yeah, I think it's called structs in Go, right? Is that yeah. right? The term? Yep. Yeah. So in Go structs, uh, I believe aren't on the heap by default. They're just like stack allocated yeah. unless you, yeah. Uh, okay. Unless so, you like do a pointer. Right. Um, yeah. 
So it's the same thing in Rock, but a difference is that in Rock, you don't have to actually declare the type ahead of time. We figure it out with type inference, but then we still stack allocate it. Whereas okay. like in Java, for example, um, you do have to declare the type, but it is always on the heap. Like an object in Java right. is always heap allocated. Um, similarly, like in JavaScript or Ruby or Python, uh, you don't have to declare the type, but they're also always on the heap. So Rock and Go are, are both doing the same thing where it's like this, this doesn't require a heap allocation. Um, and it's also the same with as many things as we can, basically. It's like numbers are not on the heap, whereas they are in Python. Um, uh, strings, strings do have to be on the heap, but um, actually we do an optimization that C++ does. If we wanted to do a really unfair benchmark, we could like try to do something that's really heavy on like string operations where they're all under like uh, 24 characters or 24 bytes in memory, because at that point we basically store them on the stack. Like we reuse all the data that would be used to store the pointers. And we, we just overwrite that with, <laughs> with the actual oh, string yeah. data. So C++ does that, we do that too. Um, so the idea being that in a lot of cases, your strings are that short. Um, and so like, we, if we don't need to, let's, let's not store a heap allocation for that. Um, but that's like, that adds a lot of complexity to the implementation, but um, we already kind of handled that. So uh, as a user of the language, that, that distinction is just like, you might notice that if your strings are kind of short, like under 24 characters, they tend to run faster, like string operations do. Um, and you use less memory, but, uh, but again, like that, that would be kind of a cheaty benchmark. Um, another thing that's different, um, and we saw this in our, we have this quick sort benchmark, uh, where quick sort is an uh, algorithm that's very dependent on mutation to run fast. And I gave mm -hmm. a talk about this called, um, outperforming imperative with pure functional languages at, at strange loop 2021, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. Nice. Um, okay. but basically, uh, one of the things that we wanted to see was can you take an algorithm that is inherently like, it's like pathologically bad for a pure functional language. And can we do well at it anyway, because of all of our optimizations behind the scenes. And okay. so where we ended up was um, if you uh, quick sorted, it was a million, uh, we had to change it actually to, <laughs> to, to be a 64 bit floating point numbers. Originally I had them as integers, but it turns out that JavaScript's really bad at integers, <laughs> uh, 64 bit <laughs> integers. So we had to change it to floats just to not unfairly penalize JavaScript. Um, so we did Java, JavaScript, Go, Rock, and C++, I think were the five languages that we did. Um, and we also did Haskell, but that was, it kind of didn't, didn't really matter. It was kind of more to make a point about Haskell. Um, but basically then we just like graphed, like how fast could we quick sort those numbers? And we always, in every case, we started with the exact same set of numbers, which had been pre-randomized ahead of time to the same randomized set. Um, and basically we came up with two graphs. One was where we did that for a million numbers. Another one where we did that for a thousand numbers. And for the million numbers one, it was like, if I remember right, it was like JavaScript was the slowest and Java was a little bit faster. And then uh, Go was a little bit faster than that. And Rock was a little bit, very, very slightly faster than Go. And then C++ was a little bit faster than Rock, but they were all like kind of close. Um, for a thousand numbers, it was not close because Rock and Go and C++ were all like itty bitty little bit of runtime and Java, Java and JavaScript were like pff, massive runtime because the JIT kicks in around 4,000 iterations of a loop. So oh. they were still running in interpreted mode. They weren't actually getting the, the optimizations yet. And that was kind of the point of that was, you know, I, I think when people talk about like JIT, so that's just in time compilation, in a lot of cases, people have this idea in their heads of like, it's this magic wand that like makes your code faster in general, but it's not actually true. It's, it's that like what happens with the JIT is your program is running and it's making a counter as you go every time you do some sort of iteration of a loop. And it says, how many times are we doing this? And once it passes some threshold, let's say like 4,000 in the case of JavaScript and uh, Java, it says, okay, that's enough. This seems to be a big loop. And I'm actually going to stop running this loop right now. And I'm going to take the contents of this loop and I'm going to compile it into machine code, like what Go and Rock and C++ do from the get-go always. But they're doing this at runtime. And they say, now that I've got this machine code thing, like what those other ones had <laughs> from the get-go, now I'll run that for the rest of the iterations of the loop until it runs out. And the, the challenge of that, or, or, or I guess the downside of that is if you have a bunch of small loops instead of like one big loop, it never kicks in. Like if you have a bunch of, you know, your, your data sets are all like, uh, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand, or maybe a couple dozen, or even a, a couple of elements in them, you're not getting the JIT benefit from any of those. And that's a thing that comes up in the real world pretty often and depending yeah. on your workload it might be the norm but yet in the benchmarks people always in order to like make them fair they'll always choose a number that's like way over the jit threshold and i wanted to show both to be like 
yeah, it, you know, there's a, th these are all pretty close, you know, if, if you're running a huge workload, but even if you have a bunch of small loops, like the difference between like rock and go and C plus plus and Java and JavaScript is actually very large. Yeah. I want to re I want to like reiterate that and say, say it back uh, sure. just because I think it's an important point and to make sure I understood it. So um, JIT stands in just in time, right? Yeah. And in this case, we're talking about just in time compiling yes. and it sounds like C++, Go and Rock, they compile a binary. So like yes. machine code that you can yeah. run on your computer as an executable. If you're on Windows, right, you've probably seen .exe, right? This is like an exactly. executable. Yeah. Uh, if you're on Linux, there's usually not a file extension, but it's just like right. a binary that is compiled to your architecture. Um, you don't need any external programs to be able to run this thing. Your computer knows how to run it. Exactly. Okay. And that's been like compiled and optimized. Yes. Whereas in the case of like Java and JavaScript and Java is a little confusing because you do like compile a Java program, but you're not like compiling it to machine code usually, right? You're compiling it like for the virtual machine to be able to run it, uh, like the Java byte, yeah. right? So, so technically both Java and JavaScript are interpreted languages. The difference is that Java has a compile step that compiles your source code into this binary byte code. And then that gets interpreted at runtime. Uh, whereas in JavaScript, it's the source code itself that's getting interpreted directly. So right. that's why if you want to run a Java program on your, you know, whatever your operating system is, you have to first install the Java runtime environment. You, you can't just be like, oh, I'll, I'll just get this executable and just run it with Java. You have to actually have Java installed, just like you have to have JavaScript installed either in your browser or Node.js or something like that in order to run, you know, to interpret the source code. Right. Okay. Makes sense. So like Java compiles, but it's still interpreted afterwards. So both of these languages are interpreting something. And basically what I'm understanding is we're taking whatever thing is going to be interpreted. So in Java's case, some byte code, in JavaScript's case, some source code. Yeah. And it like starts running. <laughs> and like, it just starts doing stuff, starts, you know, executing instructions. And at some point, the interpreter has some like heuristics built into it to like, I'm noticing that this thing is happening a lot. Mm -hmm. And interpreting things is kind of slow. So yes. I'm going to actually take this common operation, compile it directly down to machine code, which the entire program in the case of Rock, Go, and C++ was already compiled to machine code. And I'm yeah. going to compile that machine code, and now I'm going to run that machine code when I do this repeated operation. And it's like it's way faster now. Yeah. I, I think this is a very much an oversimplification, but I think <laughs> yeah. the easy way to have a... a well, what I'm about to say is, Rob, that was that was a good explanation. Oh, thank um, you. Okay. But, but, but I'm about to oversimplify. Um, so uh, an oversimplified way to think about why interpreters are so much slower is imagine you look at your source code and literally every single operation and every single number and every single string, every single thing in every like <laughs> token in your source code gets surrounded by an if statement. That's kind of what's going on because what what's happening with the interpreter is it's like you know the machine is like the, the cpu is like oh okay i have been told to expect a string here at this point in memory and i'm going to like do this operation then my next instruction is add this thing to that thing and i'm i've been told that those are numbers so i'm just going to add them and you know do these things whereas an interpreter is like i don't necessarily know what i've got until i like read the next line of source code or or the next byte in the byte code and those are all if statements it's like Oh, if I get this, then then I'm going to tell the machine to do this instruction. If I get this, then I'm going to tell it to do this instruction. So there's this, it's it's like this glob of extra indirection. Every single thing that you do has an extra if around it. And those really add up. There's more to it than that. It's like actually even more than that, which is why they have like more memory usage and stuff. Um, but at a baseline, that gives you kind of an oversimplified like, oh, th this is why it's a lot slower. What if you had ifs around every single thing you did? Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. And I like in the extreme case of Python, it's like even worse because it like goes line by line as it executes. Yeah. Right. So, and so um, like, yeah. If you want to see this, there's a really cool course. This is like not aimed at beginners, but if you ever, if you ever want to learn how this stuff really works. Um, so this guy, Casey Muratori, who I had on software and scripted a, a couple of episodes ago, um, he makes this course called performance aware programming. And one of the first things that he does is he takes uh, a, a really simple Python program. All it does is it loops through a bunch of numbers and adds them all up. And then he goes through the steps of like moving that to C and literally shows it getting, I think it was like a thousand times faster. And and it, it, by like making like one little change at a time, it's still like not many lines of code, but um, one of the cool things that he does is he he actually builds Python, the, the, the interpreter from source 
so that he can go through in a debugger and just show you all the things that the interpreter is doing every single line of code. So like when you see when it's doing an add instruction, it's actually way more than just one if there. It's like, it's jumping through all these function calls and like, and he's like, and here's the C version. It's like, eh, you know, that's that's an ad. It's like one <laughs> CPU, do one thing. Whereas in the other case, it was like, oh, hang on, hang on, just to do an ad? Are you kidding? That's like, oh, that's so much work. And it's it's really illuminating just to kind of see that in action. You, you do have to like, it is a paid course. So like, you, you, don't, you can't just like, I can't just link you to a YouTube video, unfortunately, but it's really cool. Um, and I, I learned a lot from that course, even though I've been like doing this stuff for like 15, 20, well, I've been programming ugh, like close to 25 years now, but uh, yeah, that, there's, awesome. there's yeah. always, there's always more stuff to learn with programming. <laughs> oh yeah. It does. It doesn't stop. And yeah, I've, I've certainly noticed there is, there's a difference between programmers who kind of do stop learning and stagnate and people that actually just keep improving uh, because yeah. that 10 years of experience in two different developers, like, don't do not always look the same. In right, fact, they rarely there's the, do. There's the there's the funny way I've heard of it of it being put. It's like you know one person could get ten years of experience where each year they learn different things, and then another person might over ten years just repeat the same one year ten times in a row. Yeah, and by the end they, <laughs> they didn't really actually learn that much. And it's crazy <laughs> because like we don't represent that like on resumes hardly at all. Oh, yeah. That's no. part of why like the whole interviewing and recruiting process is such a mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So rocks, a compiled language, yes. building compilers is famously hard. Um, <laughs> are you making use of the LLVM compiler or did you roll it from scratch? How does that work? Yes. So um, there's a bunch of different stages that a compiler does. So the first one is parsing and that's where you take the source code and you translate it into some in memory data structure that's like you can kind of analyze. You don't want to have to go one letter at a time when you're thinking about how do I type check this? That's it's not going to work. So parsing is like turn it from source code into some in memory thing. Then after that, you do like name resolution. So that's where you get like your naming errors. Like, hey, you use this variable without naming it or initializing it or something. I don't know what this thing means. Um, and that's kind of where you sort of wire all the variables together and say like they have these relationships. This one connects to this argument, you know, et cetera. Um, and then after that, you have type checking, uh, which in our case is type inference because Rock has 100% type inference. It's like a sound type system. It always correctly infers the, the types of your things, even if you don't write a type on them, which you don't have to. Um, once that's done, then you get into, uh, that, that's all of what I just described is known as the front end of the compiler. So not, not to do with UIs, it's just like, <laughs> there's kind of two sections, that's the front end, and then there's the back end. And the back end refers to what do you actually output? It's like at that point, we're like, we did all the parsing, name resolution, type checking. We sort of understand what your program is in these data structures. We've validated it. We know what we're going to produce. The back end is where we actually produce that thing. So LLVM, which originally stood for low level virtual machine, but it's never been a virtual machine. So I don't know why they chose that <laughs> acronym for it. Um, basically LLVM is a compiler back end, And its job is basically you give LLVM these data structures and it says, cool, uh, you're, you're building for, let's say an Intel CPU and a, and a Mac. I will just output an executable for you in that format. Or you're saying I'm building for uh, a Linux and it's ARM. Actually, usually it's more like ARM on Mac and <laughs> Intel on <laughs> yeah. Linux these days, but um, whatever. Uh, and you know, it's like, sure, I, I will output that. Or you say, I want WebAssembly, please. And it says, no problem, here's your WebAssembly. All of that stuff is a lot of work. And it turns out that a lot of compilers want that stuff done the same way. Um, and also LLVM does a bunch of optimizations. So you can say, I want you to, run through and optimize this for performance, or I want you to optimize this for size, like the lowest size possible of the output binary. You can tell it to optimize for different things. Um, LLVM, because it's been worked on by, like Swift uses LLVM, Rock does, C++, Rust, a lot of languages use LLVM. Um, Go does not, and we can talk about why that is and why that's actually in some ways a good thing. Um, although I did see a project, which I, I, I didn't, I, I'm not sure if they have, if the name is as amazing as I think it is, I hope it is, but it's Go LLVM, which I really hope is pronounced Gollum, because that's like what it looks <laughs> like, <laughs> except for a V instead of a U. I don't know, I don't know, but um, but it, it kind of seemed like that's like not really maintained or used or maybe worked on, I'm not sure, but it um, doesn't seem like something a lot of people are using. Just gotta but grab the did, domain name on that one. That's, that's yeah, pretty good. Yeah, right. But, but at any rate, I assume that the reason someone would do that is because they want LLVM's performance optimizations, which are like really kind of tied for best in class, basically. Um, and they're, they're sort of language agnostic. So 
The problem with LLVM and the reason that it's in a lot, a lot of ways an asset to go that it doesn't use LLVM is that it is slow. It is, it takes so long to run. Like we ran some benchmarks of, even if you turn off all the optimizations and you're like on, we don't, there's no like big rock code bases today. It's like the biggest ones are like thousands of lines of code. There's no like hundred K, you know, at all, like uh, yet. <laughs> um, but it was like, we were seeing numbers where it's like, basically, if you look at a flame graph of like, what are the different parts of the compiler that are taking time? It looks like all the compiler does is wait for LLVM and also linking. And like, that's it. And like everything else, all the parsing and type check, all the stuff that's unique to rock is just like, eh, like a little sliver on the graph. And it's like, mainly we, what this compiler does is wait for LLVM to do its thing, um, which is ridiculous. It's, it doesn't, that's, that's so, that's not acceptable. So what we do and what a couple of other languages do, Zig does this, um, for example, is that we say, okay, we will use LLVM for our optimized builds. So if you call rock dash dash optimize and you're like, I want you to, take some extra time to make my compile executable fast because this is the like production build as opposed to like development build. Um, then, then we use LLVM, but actually we took the time to write like direct to machine code backends for all those other targets I mentioned. So ARM 64, Intel, WebAssembly, um, which is like really hard and time consuming. It took a really long time. Also, I mean, I didn't do that. Like Brendan Hans Connect, Volker DeVries, and um, a couple other people like Brian Carroll for the WebAssembly one um, did that. So shout out to them and thank you to them for doing that. But if you look at this code, I mean, it's like, basically we're like, okay, if we if we want to do an if, that's 76, which, and 76 is like the CPU instruction, you know, for an if, right? Yeah, yeah. Like you just go through the manual and it's like, you know, this extremely long manual of all these like magic numbers that the CPU understands. And you're like, yep. We hit one of these, put this in the binary, you know? Um, there's just a whole bunch of magic numbers in, in that code. And so it's not nice to work with and it's understandable why basically everybody who can will probably kind of default to LLVM. But at the same time, it's also understandable why if you really value having a really fast compiler, you would say, we're just gonna use this for the optimizations because yeah. it's really slow. <laughs> that's that's fascinating. I didn't realize that was uh, that was how the trade-off works. So, so yeah. LLVM, Slow compile, slow, like LLVMs run slowly. Is LLVM written in C? C++, it's a, C++. it's enormous. It's definitely over a million lines of C++. I don't know how many millions or how many total lines. Um, and also it is a famously hard code base to get into. It's like very complicated and uh, not well optimized C++, shall we say. <laughs> okay, not, so not it's a... At any rate. <laughs> So, so it is a very large C++ project and we're accusing it of, of, of not necessarily being the most well-optimized C++, but the point is you run it on this kind of data structure that you hand it and it will produce a very fast program right. of, of, what, of, of like your code. It's like you right. give it the in-memory data structure, it'll give you a really fast um, binary that like does that thing. But yeah. the process of getting the binary of actually doing the compilation is egregiously slow which yeah, like coming from Go, the nicest thing about Go is, like I rarely have a compile time more that's more than like a second or two. Yeah. Um, and so it's like I don't even worry about like using the Go run command for the most part. Like right. I just build and run, um, build and run the executable for the most part. I'm always running in production mode, which is also kind of nice because it means I'm like testing in production mode, um, the same way I would run in production. Um, but with LLVM. I cannot believe that you guys took the time <laughs> to like build your own <laughs> compiler <Yeah. laughs> just it, for I mean, essentially it, debug mode. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's kind of what you get by default, unless you use the optimized flag. I mean, the way that I like to think of the trade-off is that the normal development build, the build runs fast, but then your compiled binary doesn't run. I mean, it's still like pretty fast. It's just not nearly as fast as it could be with LLVM. Right. Your build is slow, but then it produces something that runs fast. So that's what you use for your, you know, production build. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What are your, um, what are the languages that Rock most pulled inspiration from? So I'd actually say that the if I had to pick two, I mean, the number one is obviously Elm because Elm is like Elm is a very front end focused language, and Rock is a direct descendant of Elm that's sort of applied to other use cases. Um, so not just back end, like also command line apps and hopefully in the future, like native desktop GUIs and I want to be in like, I, I like to call it the long tail of domains. Um, like I would say Go is a more focused language in that way than Rock is. Like Go is, is pretty like 
servers and CLIs is kind of its bread and butter, um, yeah. which I certainly think that like that's an area where people right now that's actually the main area that you, people use Rock in, but it's been explicitly designed to try to get into other domains and maybe not be quite as good as languages like Elm that are or Go that are focused on those domains, but still be like a good experience in those domains and like a, a reasonable choice. Um, yeah. So as far as inspiration, I would actually put, if I had to pick a number two language, I would pick Go. And uh, the things that I think that, that Rock takes from Go, even though Go is not a functional language, and um, certainly when it comes to like the type system, they're, they're quite different. Rock's type system is very close to Elm's and really has almost nothing in common with Go's other than, I guess, numbers. Like the numbers are, are, are very similar. Okay, yeah. um, whereas like Elm just has like integer and uh, float. And then, um, but whereas Rock and Go have like unsigned and signed, 8-bit, 16-bit, you know, yada, yada, integers and so forth. Um, but, but the main ways in which Rock takes inspiration from Go, number one, like we talked about, it's like we want to re build really fast and run really fast. To be fair, Elm also does that. So you could say that comes from Elm, but it's kind of apples and oranges because Elm's not a backend language. Um, separately, though, there's this tooling philosophy. Like Go is like, we're going to ship with nice versions of like all the tools you want. So you don't need to go hunt down like all these like third party things, which may or may not be compatible in different ways and are duplicating a bunch of work. And maybe they get the same answers to compile. like, no, here's a, here's a really nice tool set that just works out the box. Go forth and enjoy, you know? Um, and that's something that we really want to do. Um, so right now, so for example, when you get the, the rock, um, compiler, it also gives you like some basic package management. Like you can just like say, here's a URL and it'll just come and like download that for you. Um, you can say, uh, it's got testing built in. So like you built on top of Git, like it'll download like a Git repo. Is that? Uh, it's not, it's not actually, it doesn't use Git. It uses, um, it's a little bit more general than that. Um, you can have a whole digression on, on package management, but it's basically just like a, a tarball of like okay. where you want. So actually people will use GitHub releases for this, um, because okay. it produces tarballs. Um, but basically, uh, yeah. So, so there's that, uh, there's, uh, for, we want to also put an even more advanced package manager on it, kind of similar to what Go ended up doing with Go modules. Um, that's like their uh, version resolution algorithm in particular is something that I definitely want to like directly use uh, for our package management system. Um, but also there's like a formatter. So uh, like GoFunct is like famously zero configuration possible. It's like, there's nothing to argue about. It's just like format your code done. We want to do that same thing. Um, Elm format works the same way, but Elm format is not built into the, like in the Elm community, everybody uses it, but it is a separate tool. We're like, nope, bake it in. We already have that. That's like rock form. You say rock space format. It just formats your code, no configuration, done. Nice. Um, uh, we, we have testing baked in already. Uh, so you can say rock test and it just runs all your tests. Um, we want to integrate um, hot code loading into your uh, development build. So I'm working on watch right now. And then we have a design in mind for after that um, hot code loading. So like you just hit save and like you're running web server just updates with the latest thing. And like That's extra code that comes in, it's, <laughs> you know, it doesn't need to reconnect yeah. to the database or anything. Um, that yeah, might that, be the that, first like language that does that, that I'm aware of. Um, at a language level, perhaps. Uh, I mean, so like Rails does it. Um, right. But, uh, I know there's but, frameworks. But the first compiled it. language. Yeah, that might be the case. And this is, that's actually another example of like um, functional programming making a hard problem easier. Like the, the only reason that we're able to do that is because basically uh, like everything is represented as pure functions. So it's really easy to just swap it out because there was actually, we had a close call with this where um, there was a particular set of problems where I was debating introducing a language feature that had something in common. It was basically a way to store global state at the language level. And it, it still would basically be represented as IO, but it was kind of a convenience and it was, it seemed like it would have some nice, uh, use, use cases. Um, but I realized when we started talking about hot code loading, that it would just totally break that because now mm. when you say like, Hey, just swap in this new compiled binary, it's like, yeah, what about all that global state that's in the old one? And like, oh God, now we have to go like what, track it all down and copy it over and hopefully- Try to do a mapping, yeah, that sounds like, like Oh no, hell. oh no. And like <laughs> most languages just have to actually deal with that if they're trying to do hot code loading. But then I was like, okay, never mind. This is not actually an ergonomics improvement. This is like, I mean, maybe in some cases it would have been, but it's like, mostly what this does is it makes one of our like really nice features stop working. <laughs> or right. like become, become like way harder and more error prone to implement and probably would like buggier which is a typical problem with hot code loading is that like, you know, you, you get it working and it makes a really nice demo and then someone tries to use it and they're like, this thing makes so many mistakes that I stopped trusting it. And I just I go back just refresh to the page. Yeah. yeah, right. So it's, it's gotta be actually reliable for people to use it in practice. And so that was the type of thing where we're like, yeah, never mind. We're not going to do that because we don't, you don't need the feature. It was just like, it seemed like a nice way to solve certain things. And 
Um, I mean, I, I guess that just kind of goes to show that it's like, even as like the language designer of a, of a pure functional language, it's still easy sometimes to be able to like, forget about like the benefits and like take them for granted. And then uh, until you have something where you're like, oh, actually I need this. Like I need the caching or I need the hot code loading to work <laughs> reliably. And then you're like, oh yeah, never mind, never mind. Let's, let's not, let's not do side effects after all. Let's not, <laughs> let's not do any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as the, as the designer of a new purely functional language, what is your most unpopular software engineering opinion? My most, okay, overall, most unpopular software engineering opinion, <clears throat> I would say if you look at every popular mainstream object-oriented language, with one exception, and you took the object orientation out of that, they're all going to be better languages, I claim. <laughs> The one exception is take. Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and most people are like, no, you need, you need this, you need that, you need that. I'm like, I don't buy it. I, th I think the history has shown that basically all of the good parts of OO languages turn out to not require objects and not be object oriented specific. They're just like procedural or they're functional. And like, um, like encapsulation is just kind of a special case of like modules or go would call them packages. Like if you've got public yeah. and private, you don't need objects for that. They're just like an overcomplication. Like inheritance, like, is that a good idea? Like even in the object-oriented world, people say prefer composition to inheritance. You don't need, like inheritance is the, is the only thing that's unique to OO. Like you don't find inheritance in procedural, you don't find it in, in functional. It's just like, this is an object-oriented thing and it's considered an anti-pattern, even in, by practitioners of object-oriented programming. And it's just like, if you go down the line, you try to like isolate what's the part that's unique to OO because you don't find it in procedural, you don't find it in functional, you just get down to a set of anti-patterns, like by and large. Again, Ruby being one exception. I think if you try to take the O out of Ruby, it's not really Ruby anymore. But most languages, it's like, I think this turned out to be a mistake, which is weird because it's like, how can you call it a mistake? Because all the most popular languages are object-oriented. But I had, I had a talk called, why isn't functional programming the norm, which we briefly mentioned in, in a software unscripted episode where I kind of got into the history of like why the most popular languages are the way that they are. And spoiler alert, it's not because they were object oriented. That's more of a like historical coincidence. And, um, but I think people get, pe people tend to overvalue OO itself as opposed to being like this OO language has a lot of nice properties. And then the OO gets the credit for those things, even though I don't think it should. That's really interesting. So why is Ruby, like, why is Ruby a special case? Because is it just like so deeply, is the idea of inheritance so deeply ingrained in it? What is it? So Ruby and Objective-C are unique among like top 10 or, or I don't know if Objective-C still is because Apple's kind of intentionally been phasing it out in favor of Swift. So it's certainly going down and at some point it'll be out of the top 10 if it isn't already. Um, <laughs> but those two languages are unique among popular ones in that they follow the small talk philosophy of OO. So there's kind of this lineage of OO. The term object orientation was coined by Alan Kay in like 1970. And he came up with this language, small talk. He designed that language. Um, not at all used today, really. Um, I actually, I know one guy who's like a really big small talk fan. He's like a diehard, loves small talk. Um, but by, and that guy actually wrote RSpec, by the way, like the, the most famous Ruby testing library. So it's not like he's uh, just some, you know, random person like off in his corner doing his small talk. Um, but, uh, but basically it's, uh, it's a language that ha thinks about objects as like the main, the main idea behind objects to Alan Kay is that you have these things that are conceptually, essentially like independent computers. Like an object is basically a computer. He, he uses this phrase recursive design. And he says like the essence of recursive design is that each of the parts is as powerful as the whole. So like they're all, it's like computers all the way down and each object is like, it's kind of like the ultimate microservices it's like Alan Kay's vision for objects. And the only way they communicate to each other. So they have like a little bit of a internal state like a computer does like on its hard drive. And the only way they communicate is again, like computers with message passing. Like instead of sending mm -hmm. over the network, it's more of a conceptual message passing you can't really do exactly that if yeah. you want to be fast enough. But so that's the small talk philosophy of OO. And you could argue that's the original because that's the guy who coined the term came up with that. Subsequently, there are other object-oriented languages, C++ being the first really famous one that come from, basically they're descended from Simula, which is this language for simulations. And um, Alan Kay was also inspired by Simula. So Simula introduced objects, but not object orientation. Um, C++ and like all these other object-oriented languages that are mainstream, 
really descend from C++ sort of like as a, as a school of OA, which is where you see the like much more of an emphasis on inheritance. And they don't really talk about message passing at all. Mm. The reason I bring that up is because Ruby as a language is really all about the message passing. And like people in Ruby will do stuff like, you know, hey, what happens if I get a message saying messages being kind of like method calls? It's like, what if I get a message that I don't recognize? Then I'm going to do something totally wild and different. And a lot of like actual practical Ruby like code is written on that. Like method missing is like a really common thing that people do in Ruby. And like, you could argue abuse for right. all horrible hacks. But the point is that if you took that out of Ruby, I don't think you, it would just like not really resemble Ruby anymore. Whereas right. I think if you took inheritance out of Java, people might say, oh, actually, this is better now. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think arguably you could you could make that claim. Having that explanation about message passing makes a lot more sense now. I did an episode, I don't know, 15 back with Travis, uh, Travis Walker, and he was he was talking about method, method missing. And it was just like yeah. going over my head because not having done a yeah. lot of production Ruby, uh, it was like, wait, why, why, why would this be a problem? Like, this seems like a non-problem. I mean, uh, metaphorically, it's, it's like if your object is a web server, you get a request for a path and you're like, I don't know what to do with this. It's like having a custom 404, 404 page not yeah. found. You know, Ruby supports that at an object level. Yeah, that's fascinating. Java does not. <laughs> right. It, make, it makes a lot more sense now having that yeah. uh, framework of, of message passing. Um, okay. I have, I have one more question. Well, two more questions I want to get to really quick. Um, yeah. As... As one of the most diehard functional programming advocates that I know... Um, are there any cases where you would not choose a functional language over oh, yeah. any other language? And what are those oh, cases? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, well, the first one that comes to mind is like anytime I'm doing anything really low level, I mean, like the CPU is like extremely imperative. It's like the, nothing is more imperative than the CPU. If like, even in like C, if you do addition, it's still like, you know, I'm going to give you my two things that I want to add and it'll return to me. Another. No, in the CPU, you're like, take the contents of this register, add it to that register, and it's going to mutate a third register. It's like, it's always mutating stuff. It's never not mutating things. Um, so if you're doing low level stuff, like I, I think functional doesn't really make sense in that world. It's like you, you're, you're kind of swimming upstream for no reason. Um, I can still try to write things like using pure functions as often as possible, but, um, but trying to like go all the way to try, try to get the benefits of like, just, I don't think it's, it, it makes sense. Um, similarly, if I have something where like, I'm just writing a really quick script and I'm not thinking about like long-term maintainability or caching, it's like never going to get that complicated. And like the main thing I'm going to do is just like a bunch of IO operations in a row. It's like, do I even need a concept of like async or whatever, like a, like a, a bash script or something? It's like, not really. I, I, I don't, I don't need that. I'm just like, just here's the stuff I want to do. Just do these things in this order. I don't care which ones are IO and which ones are not. I don't need a separation of that. That's not going to benefit me. So I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to, to reach for something imperative. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say that to me, the thing that's appealing to me about functional programming is that the types of problems I've run into at work as a career in web development, more often than not, I felt that functional programming would be the best approach for that problem. But I mean, like the rock compiler is not written at all in a functional style because we want to be really close to the metal. We want to be as fast as possible. And in order to do that, we want to use a language, namely Rust in our case. Um, we'd also consider like Zig or, or C or something like that. Um, we want that level of control over memory where like, we're not thinking about like, you know, how do I, actually we do have some caching in there. So actually we have to be kind of careful with, <laughs> with that. Um, but we're not thinking about like, uh, you know, how can we make the best ergonomic experience for ourselves? Obviously, since we're like literally writing out the bytes to the machine code, <laughs> we're just thinking about like, how can we make the maximum possible use of this hardware, which is right. not something that makes sense for a lot of web companies, to be honest. It's it's more like, you know, your bottleneck is like usually the database or, or like, you know, uh, just whatever language you chose and how fast it runs on your servers. Um, but yeah, like, like we're not optimizing like, you know, CPU instructions and in, in anyone's like web backends, unless you, I guess once you get to some scale, maybe you are, but um, it's very, 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 very niche skill set to, to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would say for me, it, it absolutely depends on the problem. And it's, it's really just the thing that excites me about it is that I've run into in my career, a bunch of different use cases where I, I, I want that, that purely functional experience because it has these really nice characteristics. It sounds like in broad strokes, it's like, okay, if I want to get super close to the hardware, I might avoid functional, do some more imperative stuff. Oh, yeah. And it, it's like the extreme. So like really close to the hardware or like super high level, just like a quick script 
that's going to do a bunch of IO for me. Yeah. Like maybe Quick automate a task. Right. Yeah. Then, then I'll, uh, then I also don't necessarily care. Um, I think that's a really good answer. Last question is, um, how do you see the rock project maintaining itself into the future? Is there a business or a monetization plan there? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it's all donation funded. Um, so right now it's, I mean, it's like mostly volunteers. There's a couple of, uh, generous corporate sponsors who have been paying some of us to like work on it, you know, as part of our jobs. Um, I, I don't think anybody is like getting paid full time to work on rock. Um, but we actually want to change that with donations. So we're currently trying to get up to like 4,000 us dollars a month and worth of donations. We're not, not there yet, but we're like on the way we've had some like nice corporate do donors and a lot of individual donors. Um, and there's this, there's this one guy in Belgium who's been doing amazing contributions. We really want to try and get him a full time salary. Um, but that would be the first one. Uh, so I know that other projects have done this, like Zig is entirely funded through donations. We also have a nonprofit foundation that all the donations go into. So it's tax deductible if, if that matters to you nice. or to your, yeah. uh, to your company. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the plan is really just to kind of uh, just focus on making something that's really nice for people and not try to turn it into a business. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's some uh, organizations that have tried to do that. There's some companies that have tried to do that. Um, I don't think it's had a really good success record <laughs> uh, in this day and age. The most successful one I can think of is kind of like Kotlin, where it's basically like JetBrains makes an IDE and then they made a language that's a really good fit for their IDE. But I don't, it's not really you know a, a path that I want to go down. So yeah, no, that's awesome. I hope I hope you get a ton of uh, traffic and donations from this podcast. We're small at yeah, the moment, but we're growing. Uh, yeah. Where do you want people to go find your stuff? Where can they find Rock? Where can they find your podcast? That kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, so I'm on Twitter at RT Feldman. So that's Richard, and then my middle name starts with T, and then Feldman. Um, uh, also, uh, you can find Rock at roc lang.org. Um, and uh, honestly, if you just put Richard Feldman into YouTube, I have a bunch of talks on a bunch of different topics, so you can find that. And then uh, the podcast I host is called Software Unscripted. Perfect. Yeah, you can go find me on Software Unscripted as well. Yes, you can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we talked about Go and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on, Richard. This is, uh, this is great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah, talk to you later, man.